it's Bumble. Welcome back to my channel. So this is actually my last like planned photo two video that I plan on making this year. You guys are probably like, oh thank goodness, because I basically made nothing but portal two videos for like an entire month. Which just as a reminder, that wasn't even my plan back in like early fall. I'm just gonna play through the game, review it, play Portal Story Smell, and that was it. And then I got on the Heck Cannons and AA train, and we all know where that went. So yeah, this is my last planned one. Uh, and I picked it to be on this specific thing, because this topic is something that I kind of see as like a nice little ending to Portal 2. I mean, Portal 2 does have a nice ending, but like this one feels like kind of, what's that phrase about wrapping a bow and being done with something sort of thing? So I thought, okay, this is a good topic to make mine. I mean, this isn't probably going to be my last, like, Portal series in general video. I mean, I don't know, if 1.5 AI ever decides to work properly, I'd like to make, like, shit post videos using it. And I also plan to play the first game, too, because um, I've played it, but I haven't, like, recorded myself playing it. That's the thing, even if I've played something before, it's basically, like, playing it anew, pretty much, if I play it for my channel. So, like, some games in here I've already played. Uh, but yeah, I've heard Portal 1 is getting this, like, RTX thing, which basically makes the game look pretty and shiny. So I thought, yeah, I could do that. Plus, the first game's only, like, I don't know, an hour, maybe? You can finish it in the afternoon. Super short. Um, so yeah, what what is Blue Sky, you're asking yourself? Uh, it's a very popular Portal 2 fan fiction. Actually, probably the most popular, to be honest, and you're probably thinking, you cringe, because it's fanfiction. I'm normally that way, too. Like, I'm someone that doesn't really read a lot of fanfic. Like, I've only read, like, three, and this was one of them. But the three that I read were pretty good. The other two weren't, like, portal ones or anything. One of them was, like, folklore related And the other one had to do with Spirited Away. Anyway, um... Oh, right, I gotta read off my notes now. I forgot, I wrote notes. I've been writing more and more uh, scripts lately. It means it takes me a while to get the, the videos out more. From my perspective, not you guys as well. Um, it, hey, it helps me keep my thoughts and remember things, so maybe I'll make it a habit. But yeah, starting to read from my notes now. Um, honestly, one of the best fan fictions I've ever read. And I know I just said I haven't read a lot, but still. At the end of the day, it is a romance fan fiction, specifically with Wheatley and Chell, but it's not like one of those cringe ones that only focuses on romance or something. It like, it takes a long time to build to that point. What's that phrase people use? A slow burn? That might be the right phrase, but I don't know. But like, it takes a while. It takes till the end to build up to that. Um, and it has like plenty of just world building in general too. Like, I'm not going to describe the entire plot, mostly because I want at least someone watching this to go read this. I'll just write about my thoughts, but I also actually won't spoil anything for once. Um, like, I'd even recommend this one to a Portal fan, even if they didn't ship the characters or care about any of this stuff. Just because I think the story and the, for this fan fiction and the character development is really good. And like I said, if anything, I'd consider this to be like a proper ending to the series. I mean, yeah, the game had a good ending, Chell got released, and... Gladys doesn't kill anyone, but it bumps me out that Wheatley just ends up stuck in space and never gets to apologize to Chell. If you're one of the people who gets sad about that, then this might be for you, actually. Um, except the one interesting thing about this is this is one of those where they put a character into like a human body. They do it to Wheatley in this through like this aperture invention, which is like an avatar body that's made out of hard light, so it's like he looks and is basically human, but still technically a robot. I don't know, it's kind of hard to explain. And of course this, okay, you know what? Yeah, I gotta actually describe this a little bit so you know what the hell I'm talking about. Quick bumble summary of this. Um, it takes place after Portal 2. I think like four, it's supposed to take place like four years after the second game. Uh, it starts off pretty much exactly where the game left off, more or less. Um, with Wheatley and the Space Corps being stuck in space, and then the Space Corps gets hit by a meteor and is killed off immediately. Um, and Wheatley gets blasted to Earth, and 
I'm pretty sure it lands at Aperture. Yeah, yeah, he ends up at Aperture somehow. Um, conveniently, out of anywhere in the world, that's where he ends up at. Oh no, wait, he tries to send like an SOS or some shit, and Gladys picks up on it, I think. Um, yeah, and then, you know, she's got him in his grasp, but instead of killing him, she decides to use him to her advantage. Mainly because Gladys has reached the point where it's like she's tired of testing robots and she misses Cho and wants to have human test subjects again. So she forces Wheatley, um, instead of killing him, to send this like SOS radio signal to see if like anyone would pick up on it. And Cho, who now lives in this like little town, but it's, I don't want to say post apocalyptic, it's more of like. I don't know, they describe it as like this kind of town where it's like, there's all kinds of people in it, anyone who just wanders in is kind of just welcome, it's like, I'd say it's like humanity picking up the pieces, really, which I think is interesting, because it's like, you know, Aperture and like Portal as a whole, it's like super futuristic and stuff, and then with this, it's like you go outside and not futuristic at all. I don't know when it's supposed to take place, or if it's like supposed to be connected to Half-Life or not, because... If there was any Half-Life references at all, they probably all went through my head, but... They mention about some kind of war, or like, some shit going on in the surface pre chell escaping, so... Might have to do with that. Uh, but yeah, she lives in this little town, I think it's called, like, Eden or something, conveniently. And she just works there as a baker, um, and picks up on this radio signal. And for whatever reason, uh, decides to go rescue Wheatley, and... He, he almost dies, and she transfers him into, like, the Avatar thing that I mentioned as, like, a last resort. And they have to try and escape, and he almost leaves her there to die and changes his mind. And has to, like, carry her over to this town. Um, oh, God, why does my throat hurt so much? Ugh, okay, anyway, um, he has to carry her there. And then from there, it's mostly, like, him trying to figure out how to be human without literally being, like, an actual human. And then her having to, like, help him with that and them bonding and, like, other stuff I'll mention here. But that's basically the basics of this, pretty much. Um, they really just say basically the basics. Okay, that's what I get for recording after a long day of school, you guys. Um, but thankfully on my end, when I'm recording this, it's almost Thanksgiving break, so... I get to chill soon, play Pokemon. Anyway, um, I like how the language is written in this as well. Like, the characters feel like stuff that they'd actually say. And the way the Aperture stuff has its own technology, um, okay, what was I going to say about that? It's not in my notes. It's like, y you know how it is in the games where you can't just call it, like, the portal gun. you got to call it, like, the Aperture handheld portal device, you know how they always make something, like, really long and blind to this gapping, uh, sounding? Yeah, the fanfiction gets that down perfectly with stuff. Even when it introduces the whole, like, Avatar invention thing to make Wheatley basically human or something, they have, like, Chell, she's in this, like, hidden off place in Aperture, um, She's an old aperture, maybe, and she finds it. It's like there's like a little advertisement she sees, and then it reads it, and you read it, and then it um, it's it's written like exactly like something Cave Johnson would say. It's great. Uh, I don't even remember why the fanfiction said that it's in universe that's there now, but it's a weird company. Whatever. Um, anyway. And even if something seems a little weird, there's always some kind of explanation for it, no matter how small. Like, for example, there's this one part in the beginning, um, where Chell is looking around a room with a torch, and then it mentions how Wheatley's eye-face thing is lighting up a dark room, so you're like, wait, what? But then it says that Chell, like, dropped the torch or something, for example, because you're probably thinking, like, why is she using a torch if Wheatley's eyes glowing or something, but, no, she drops it or whatever, um, and their relationship is really nice in this too, even though it's a romance fiction at the end of the day, they have to build up to that, and it doesn't, it doesn't feel like one of those where it's, like, shoving the romance stuff, like, in your face, it feels 
feels like I'm watching almost like a very watered down rom com type thing. Not that this is a rom com, but like you know, the romance stuff isn't in your face, it's just kind of there, they hint at a few things, and even at the end, it's not, like, anything super aggressive or whatever, so, no, I appreciate that, I, I mean, this is a ship that I have, it's why I read this in the first place, because I shipped them, but, like, it isn't in your face, and I'm glad, um, and just the way they kind of start that relationship, too, like, Chell is still pissed at him, um, why did I say that way? Yeah, Chell's still pissed at Wheatley for trying to kill her at the, um, at the beginning of the fanfiction, because, like I said, he almost leaves her to die. I think it's like they're almost right out the door to leave, and she gets shot in the leg by a turn, and the party escort bot is, like, showing up to, like, drag her away, and he's thinking, like, how he could finally leave, and he has, you know, he has legs now, obviously, so he doesn't depend on her anymore. And he almost ditches her and then, like, decides to go back. Um, so when he apologizes, like, about that and for trying to kill her in the game, uh, she doesn't accept it immediately. She just asks him to prove it. So just giving him a second chance. And I really like that because in both games she works so hard to be able to escape the facility and be happy. So Wheatley has to work to get to any of that kind of happiness, too. And I'm glad that she doesn't just, like forgive him immediately, because honestly, he put her through hell, <laughs> doesn't deserve to be, um, I was gonna say approved, no, um, forgiven right away, I just, I don't know, that, it's like, even though Chell's someone that just isn't really written to have a personality, the things they have her say and do in this feel right, I don't, I guess, oh no, that's my list, Next line in the notes, cool. Oh yeah, because she talks in this. She's not, like, actually mute or anything. Um, looking over my notes, I, I had a thought in my head, and it's not in my notes, so I'll just say it anyway. Because um, even though she isn't mute anymore, she, um, or, no, they wrote it's like she wasn't mute at all. She just, like, I think the usual answer of, like, how she doesn't want to give them satisfaction or whatever. Um, she doesn't actually talk a lot. Like, sometimes it'll switch to her POV and, sh like, you hear her thoughts or whatever, and it'll write her as someone who, like, doesn't use a ton of words if she doesn't need to. She doesn't talk too much. She's not, like, grumpy or rude or anything. She's just, like, very quiet. Just as a person, that's who she is, which I think is neat. And it also, the fanfiction really tries to hammer in of, like, how much her and Wheatley are supposed to be opposites and everything. Because, you know, he can't shut up and she barely talks. That's just one of the examples I mean. Uh, but yeah, her personality and dialogue isn't, like, anything crazy. They write her, like, pretty realistically, I'd say. It's, like, the survivor, you know, through all the portal shit she's been through and doesn't ha really have too much of a personal life um, other than baking bread and then caring about her new friends. The cool thing with the bread thing, by the way, You'd probably think, like, oh, that's kind of weird, but there's this backstory they give her through these flashbacks and stuff, and it, that even relates to the bread making thing, for example. Like, everything kind of connects to each other, and it's really satisfying. Um, yeah, her character development is interesting because she goes from this person that isn't really close to anyone. Like, she cares about the people in the town, and some of them she's, like, friends with, but she doesn't really seem, like, super close or, like, chummy with anyone, um, but then when she hangs out with Wheatley and gets some of her memories back, cause they both have amnesia in this, um, she starts, like, softening up, and there's even this scene that sort of, like, signifies that change a bit, um, where she's trying to get Wheatley to remember his first memory, it's actually a part I read pretty recently, oh, here's the thing, I've read through this whole thing once, I think around the time when I first played the game, so like a few years ago, quite a few years ago, like probably when I was still in middle school or something, and then I was rereading it, um, this year, this like school semester for me, still haven't finished it, I'm like halfway, but like I remember enough that I could talk about it, um, and I'm also not going to spoil the ending, so it's not like I need to finish it, I mean I will eventually, but I wanted to record this, uh, but anyway, she's trying to get him to remember his first memory, and she puts 
They emphasize that she puts her hands, her fingers, like, on his temples, which surprises her because she's never been that touchy before with anyone. Um, anyway, they're both really the main focus of the story, with each chapter, chapter, chapter or so, uh, switching their perspective, like, two or three times. Okay, now I gotta talk about the negatives of this, because there is, like, some negatives, of course. Um, the main thing that really bugs me with this is the way they write Wheatley. Most, because here's the thing, they get his dialogue down right, like, the way, like, I'll read a line, multiple lines, I guess, because he's a character that never shuts up. And I can just read it exactly in his voice, that's how, like, on a character it is, and his actions, for the most part, make sense in the way he reacts to things, so he's basically, he's basically like a human person now, and not like a little metal ball, and getting used to being around all these other humans, and not being in the aperture hellhole anymore. Uh, but what kind of bugs me is how much of a fish out of water they make him. For example, we could say about children, uh, like there's this little girl he meets, and her name's Ellie. It's like when he first gets into the town, he's like carrying Chell on her back, and there's like this little girl on a swing, and she freaks out and screams. Because of course they make him look a lot like his voice actor, so they have him be really tall, but the fiction, the fanfic for some reason always emphasizes about him being like freakishly tall than everyone else. I don't know why, that's just kind of funny to me. Uh, yeah, this child sees him and sees him like carrying like Chell on his back, on his back, thinking she's like dead or something, and the little girl like runs off and screams. Anyway, um, he freaks out too because he thinks he sees her and says something of like along the lines of like somebody shrinking a human and wondering why she's so small. I think he even calls her like shrunky at some point, and then he realizes like, oh, okay, this is a child. And that was weird to me, because there's a part in the game, um, when you go look at the potato batter experiments, uh, when you're trying to, like, you know, uh, turn off the turns and turn off the neurotoxin and stuff, and he mentions about, like, children and talking about them. He knows what children are and roughly what they look like. Like, I, he says something of, like, he makes fun of them, and he makes fun of the projects, saying that, like, he could do better than that, or, like, whatever. And he says some line of, like, right, I know that they're children, but, or something like that. So it's, like, very obvious he knows, for example, what children are, but then he sees this child and, like, completely freaks out. Especially the part where he mentions of, like, she's basically like a shrunken down human and that just feels out of character it's like um i don't know if he's actually seen a child in person before but that just felt like way too dramatic of a reaction to me um because that's the thing he knows like a surprisingly large amount of topics like if you pay attention to his dialogue Especially when he's just rambling about stuff. Like, he mentions about all kinds of stuff that you wouldn't think he knows about. So, the fact that they have him, like, react to things, to new things, like, for every little thing, just doesn't feel right with how they portrayed him in the games. Um, and the other thing, too, is how he just follows Chell around everywhere um, and doesn't really interact with anyone else, like showing distaste in the men that Chell's friends with, which I mean, I guess that's part of the romance aspect, but whatever. Um, and if there's anyone he's close with, it's mostly the little girl, um, and this one other character I'll mention later. I mean, okay, this isn't something that I dislike, because I guess it does mean, um, there's more focus on, like, Wheatley and Chell and their relationship, but it still feels weird, because, and, like, I get it that Chell's the only one who knows, but you think with Wheatley being the blabbermouth he is, he would probably try and talk to everyone. I don't know. I feel like having him settle into the community and getting to know people would have helped his character development. It's like them accepting him as more human. Because I don't remember if they find out he's a robot, but I'm like five chapters in and there's only like two people that actually know. Um, yeah, because there's this guy... Because part of the plot is that there's this huge 
radio tower thing that this guy is working on, trying to get it to work, um, and Wheatley befriends the guy, and that's when the character just figures out he's a robot. And I think the guy, I remember a scene, not from what I've reread lately, but the first time I read this, because it just stood out to me, that the guy gives him, like, the robot equivalent of moonshine at some point. Maybe I imagine that, I don't know, I just thought that was funny. Anyway, um, it's just those two things of him being, like, a super duper fish out of water, and him, like, not really interacting with, like, the side characters just feels like really out of character to me for him um and even though there's more of a focus on Wheatley I like how him and Charlie both the main characters and both gain character development because it's like he's got to struggle with learning to be humanoid and more importantly being able to prove himself both like to Chell and to himself and everyone else really um and then Chell on the other hand has to learn to trust people more and open up as a person and of course they both have missing memories that turn out to be related to each other um and it's interesting to me how they both kind of reflect on that where Chell knows that she can't remember certain things like she knows what her name is but doesn't know who her parents are for example and where she lives that that kind of thing i don't remember the exact phrasing the way they had it where it's like there's some things there's things she knows how to do but then there's other like basic details that about herself she has no idea about and that she um, is really curious about those and it just bothers her a lot and then with Wheatley it's sort of a similar thing where he feels like he's missing something and that those things he's supposed to know too so they it's not like they try to figure it out together or anything because the way these get revealed Oh, okay, it's in the next part of my notes. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll start with my notes then, and then I'll emphasize. I like how in different chapters, we basically get what I'd call a B-plot, pretty much, of Wheatley's memories, um, which are treated as flashbacks that he has in dreams, because it's not like he actually He sort of does. He sleeps in Chell's couch, and every time he falls asleep, he has a dream. Um, and all of these dreams are, like, little bits and pieces of his memories and there's not like ever like completely connected together like as one complete thing that you could read but they're like scattered around in the chapters um and these tell a story of him as this human employee at aperture and not like in the avatar body i mean like pre okay i'll emphasize pre glados old aperture he's this human employee who falls in love with this bagel delivery girl, um, which is supposed to be Chell before the games in the store. And then right before he tries to talk to her for the first time. Because they explain, like, he's ordered a bagel from her every day for three months, but has never had a conversation with her. And it's like, at this point, it's like he's planning to talk to her for the first time and planning on asking her out. He gets taken away and dumped into a corner. Honestly, kind of the saddest part of the fic, because you know it's going to happen, because you know how he turns out. Uh, especially because, like, that thing where it reveals that. Like, it's it's this part I read recently where it's, like, he wrote himself something on a post that said he's hyping himself to go talk to her. He's, like, hiding behind a plant or something, and he steps out from the plant. He's ready, and then these people show up to talk to him. And the last line and that is something along the lines of him hoping that it won't take too long and that with whatever they're doing is done that he can go talk to the bagel girl because he doesn't even know what her name is or anything obviously and it ends like with that memory there but of course you know that these what happened especially because the section right before that is about his first memory um of like him being turned on for the first time or something as a core and he talks and acts like the exact same way as in the game, but obviously with no memories of his like original existence and stuff, and it just kind of hammers that in, and I don't know, it's kind of sad. Um, and with the way Cho gets these memories too, it's like, he has these through dreams and occasionally mentions them to her, but she doesn't know what the hell he's talking about, because he doesn't like actually explain anything, and she's like, oh, whatever, this is a weird dream. And then at some point she like plugs a USB into him and 
literally saved these memories like watching a movie on her computer and then freaks out from seeing herself in the memories and realizes like, oh, those are basically the memories I'm missing too because she's in there. Um, and I haven't actually gotten farther than that, so I don't remember what happens next. But anyway, I'd say the two scenes out of everything I've read so far, and even before I read this that kind of just stood out to me, is um, this part I had just mentioned where she plugs in USB and sees herself. And that part honestly just always gives me chills. Because it's like you feel a little bit of tension there of her. She's um, kind of doubting herself of like, should I really be doing this? Because she's, you know, it's definitely an invasion of privacy if your friend's like this robot person. And you just go and you literally look inside of their head on a computer and see what their memories are. You know, it's a bit invasive, I'd say. Um, and then there's a scene a few chapters before that. Um, one of Chell's friends in the town runs this, like, general store or something, and she goes to talk to him in the back um, to get whatever uh, equipment she needs for, like, I'm sorry, Wheaton spray and noise escape. And they tell him to, like, kind of run the store for a bit. And, of course, the first customer there is that little girl I mentioned. But anyway, she freaks out again seeing him. And he's just talking to her like normal, like, oh, hey, you're the kid with the wellies. Do you? And I didn't know what wellies were. They're reindeers, by the way. I had to look that up. Um, and he's like, oh, hey, what can I get you or whatever? Because she's there to, like, shop something for her parents or something. And I like her from her perspective because it switches from, like, him talking to her and then to her perspective. Um, and it's of just, like, how she sees him as this monster instead of just some guy, which is really funny because, of course, the reader and the player know he's, like, outside of the part where he becomes the villain, he's basically harmless. Like, even in this, once he's put in a human body, he's still pretty much completely harmless and can't do anything right. I mean... If anything, the only way to cause his chaos is because he's clumsy as hell and doesn't know how to do anything. But it's not like he's actively malicious or anything. Um, but no, I, I don't remember what it's called, where it's like, it's not, where you're reading from someone's perspective, but it's like, you know, like how when you just read and it'll be third person, I think, when it uses the person's name. It has that, and the way that that part's written, it's something of, like, how she remembers her parents told her that monsters weren't real and that they were all, like, killed off before she was born. And it's, like, really dramatic, and it's like, oh, yeah, they they lied, there's a monster here, it's done something to chill, blah, 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 blah. And it's just funny to me because I can imagine someone reading it in, like, a Morgan Freeman voice or said, or, no, no, kind of maybe, like, Liam Neeson and Kagan, those kind of voices is what I thought of immediately as soon as I read that part, and I know I'm talking about it and you're like, bumble what, but like, I don't know, if you go read this, you get to that part, it's not like a super well-known scene or what, whatever, it's not like one of the standout ones, obviously, but like, I don't know, it stands out to me. Um, yeah, I won't spoil the ending to this for once with anything I've talked about. Mostly because I don't remember it, but I also want you guys to read this instead. Um, but it, from what I remember, it makes everything else worth it. Um, and I'd honestly just recommend this to anyone. Well, okay, no. I mean, if you've never played Portal 2, then this isn't really going to make sense because it takes place after the game and is very much, like, character-focused and character development-focused and stuff. Like, it doesn't constantly refer to stuff in the games, but it does for certain things, like if a character has a flashback, or they think about something, or make a reference, or whatever, you know? You had to play the games to play this. But to anyone who has played Portal 2, hey, I'd recommend this to you, honestly. Because, um, yeah, even though I've only read, like, three fan fictions, this being one of them, this was one of the super good ones. Um, yeah, I know I'd said, like, oh, this is, like, a little bit romancy, but, like, it's not in a cringe way or, like, in your face or whatever. It's, I don't know, if you at least like these characters or, I don't know, want something that feels like Portal, but, I mean, obviously it's not going to have the same Portal humor and it's a book instead of a game. So you want more after the game, basically. Uh, go read this. 
Um, but yeah, that's about it. I liked it. I wanted to talk about it because I like bringing things I like to people's attention. So, thanks for watching. Oh wait, also, I didn't know what to put as the thumbnail for this because, you know, it's not like this is an official thing. It's not like there's official art. I didn't want to go find fan fiction for this because I didn't know what I was going to go find. So, I literally just wrote the title on here. Um, and I picked the shade of yellow because... I always keep thinking about this part, um, when Wheatley and Shell go outside for the first time and they're in the wheat field and everything's super fire and sunny, so I thought, yeah, blue and yellow, that would work. Alright, thanks for watching.